Great. Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, this week uh, is a Realm week, so we're going to be talking about um, instance creation in Realm today. So looking at how you create instances, how those instances are laid out in memory, and then also how we build accessors to actually access the data uh, in, inside of those instances. So, you know, just to start off, this is the instance.h header file. Um, an instance is uh, a primitive realm type. Uh, we call it a region instance, but, you know, I guess you could just, I, I guess more, more colloquially, we just call it an instance. Um, and so an instance is going to be an allocation of actual memory with a particular layout uh, for a particular index space. Um, and it's actually, you know, how we actually store data uh, inside the machine. Every instance is going to have a location, right, uh, that will allow you to, to know which memory it's been allocated in. Um, it has some methods here for actually accessing the data, like read and write untyped, but that's not actually the common way to access the data in this instance. Um, you know, there's also read and write methods here, but but more commonly, and you see these takes offsets into the instance, but but more commonly, that's like the way to actually access most instances will be with an accessor, uh, which will help hide some of the details of how the data inside this instance is actually laid out. Um, so we'll actually actually look at that uh, uh, in this uh, this session today. Um, let's see, if you look at how an instance is created, um, this is the most generic form of the instance creation. So this is a static method uh, on the instance class, right? So you create an instance by uh, saying which memory you want to allocate it in. Um, you pass in one of these instance layout generic objects, uh, which we're going to look at today to show you how to describe the layout of this instance. Uh, you can pass in some profiling requests uh, that will actually, you know, allow you to request information about the uh, about the instance uh, for as it's uh, as, as it's alive, and then when it's when it's done, it'll actually give you some profiling results back about the instance. Um, and you can also pass in an, an event precondition, right? Uh, effectively saying, don't try to create this instance until this event has triggered, right? And so that won't actually allocate any memory until until that that event has actually uh, actually you know triggered. And you get back an event saying when this instance is is actually actually ready. Um, one important detail you can see in this comment up here, right? Calls to create instance can return immediately with a handle, right? But that uh, but if you've given giving back an event with that handle, that means that you may not actually have a valid instance yet, right? That you can't actually use this instance until the event is triggered. And in particular, you may also need to wait for for a profiling request to come back and say like, hey, this is actually a valid instance that succeeded in its allocation, right? Because if you pass an event precondition. Right, Realm won't even try to do the allocation until until that event has triggered, and therefore, you know, it gives you back a handle, you know, in the case that that, that allocation succeeds, but that allocation can still fail, and so you might have to, to test for that later. Uh, we'll see a little bit of that code today, I think. Um, but but this is the most common form. There are a couple of helper methods down here for clients that you know don't want to actually have to build a full instance layout generic. So some of these let you pass in things like field sizes and whether to do like SOA or AOS uh, kinds of layouts and index spaces and stuff. And they'll actually build this instance layout generic. We're actually gonna look at some of this code that actually will help build an instance layout generic in, in some of these cases. So you can see examples of that. But these are all just helper methods down here that are variations. This is the truly general version uh, that lets you actually pass in one of these instance layout generic objects. Um, there's also support for external instances. I'm not gonna do that today. We'll, we'll save that for a future uh, future lesson, but effectively external instances are just ways of attaching to memory that's already been allocated outside of Realm, like say, you know, if somebody calls, you know, malloc or kuda malloc or anything like that. There's a way to effectively register that with Realm and say, create an instance, but know that this memory, this external instance resource, you know, effectively has been previously allocated and we're just wrapping it in a Realm instance. And that's one external instance is. So we won't look at that today. Uh, we're going to focus mostly on this, uh, this create create instance call uh, here, and actually looking at you know uh, how you actually actually allocate an instance. Okay, so if I go look at instance here, oh, I guess a create instance is probably actually in instance .inline. So let me uh, oh, let's see if I can copy and paste successfully. Apparently not. Not sure how we get that there. Yeah. So here's create instance. Actually, this is the generic one, and you can see this. Uh, this is this or this one, not the generic one. This is one of the one that takes the field sizes, um, and you can see this calls this this choose instance layout, which we'll actually go look at uh, here in a little bit, uh, and then it calls the generic one. Um, where is the generic one? It might actually be in the base class. Uh, yep. Yeah, it might actually be an instance.cc. 
Oh, and apparently that is not a file. So I thought I had memorized this, but apparently not. I might need to go digging for this one. Let's see. Nope, okay. Um, let's actually go take a look at this instance layout generic, choose instance layout, because I think this will actually show you how to make one of these uh, instance layout generics, and it's actually gonna be one of the key parts of what we're actually looking for here today. So let's see if I find the right uh, file over here. That's mempool. We want, let's see. Yeah, here it is. Choose instance layout. Okay. So how, how do you actually make an instance layout generic? So this is a class, actually, let me show you what the instance layout generic uh, type hierarchy looks like, and then we'll uh, we'll come back and, and see how we make one. Um, so an instance layout generic um, is a general base class. It's a, it's a pure virtual interface. Um, actually not pure virtual, there's a, actually a, a member variable in here and a couple of, uh, a couple of constructors and stuff, but Effectively, an instance layout generic is just the base virtual class uh, for all kinds of layouts that you might want to make in Realm, right? And effectively, um, there are a couple static methods here that we're going to look at for how to make uh, these these instance layout generic objects. Um, but uh, in general, like uh, like mostly, users should probably try to create these things directly and actually instantiate these uh, these classes themselves. So you know they've got helper methods here, but that's sort of like a uh, like a crutch to help you get through you know your early days of learning how to use this stuff. Um, the most important thing that you're going to have uh, in particular is you're going to have this map of field IDs. So for every field in your instance that you're going to create, right, you're going to map to some pointer inside of a list of uh, what are going to be uh, instance layout lists, um, and we'll go go look at those. But but effectively you're going to have and you'll notice we'll come back and look at what the value what these members are on this struct that actually are telling you different things um, but um, these are going to index into a list of of data structures that describe the the actual uh, layout for this instance um, other more general members here right so effectively this is actually the size of the instance this is the total number of bytes required for this instance right so effectively by the time you've done constructing this you know this needs to be filled in with the total the maximum number of bytes and this needs to be, you know, effectively the the alignment that's required for this instance when actually when Realm actually goes to do the uh, the allocation. Now, there's a couple uh, base cl or inherited classes from instance layout generic. So the the most you know simple one is this instance layout opaque. Uh, very very few things actually use this, but this is effectively just like if you just want to make a an instance that's just a, a blob of bits, um, you can do that. Um, and so you can use the instance layout uh, opaque class, right? And inherits from instance layout generic. Right, and then you can go and and fill that in. Um, let's see. The more common uh, version of instant, or the more common use of, or inherit, or the more common derived class from instance layout generic uh, is actually this one, uh, which is this instance layout class. Um, and in particular, uh, let's see. Uh, you'll notice this this one is actually templated, right? So this is actually templated on the number of dimensions. Uh, in your index space for for this instance, as well as the coordinate types uh, for this instance, right? Uh, whether you're, you know, in, in indexing with unsigned integers for your points or or longs or whatever you want, right? Um, and so what you see is that this instance layout class actually has you know an index space that describes the entire space uh, for this instance, right? Effectively saying these are all the points that are going to be contained in this instance. And then additionally, it also has um, a piece list. And you know, it's actually a vector of piece lists. Uh, so we're gonna go look at this instance piece list class, or that class. But what we've got here is actually a vector of those things. And the important thing about this vector is that this vector is actually indexed by fields that all have sort of the same piece list. And, and let me actually define what a piece is here first. The idea of a piece is, is effectively, it's going to be a, dense rectangle um, uh, of data, right? And so like, if you have like a sparsity map in this space, right? Like most likely you're, what you're gonna do is have a separate piece for every one of those rectangles, right? So uh, if, if say you wanted to make like a compact, uh, a compact representation of the data for a sparse index space, you would have a piece list where you'd have a piece corresponding to every rectangle in the sparsity map for this, for this index space. 
right? And that allows you to lay things out densely. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. You could actually, you know, this piece list, these pieces in here don't have to be exactly the same as the rectangles that, you know, are in the, in the sparsity map for this index space. The only requirement is that they actually cover the points in this space. So, like, you could actually compute, you know, a set of rectangles that, that span this, all of the points in the space, but are actually over approximated, right? And that, that will waste a little bit of memory, um, but, like, it'll still make it, uh, but, but it might make it more efficient to access, like, the, uh, the pieces inside the instance. And we'll see some examples of how you do that with accessors uh, later today that, you know, the fewer pieces you have, the more efficiently you'll be able to do random access into all those pieces and stuff. Right, um, and in the most gen in the most like simple case, I guess the base case, right? You could just have a single rectangle, right, which is the bounding box for this index space, right? And then you just have one piece. So your piece lists would all be of size, like your lists would all be of size one, saying that there's only a single single piece uh, for each one of those, uh, 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 for each one of those um, uh, fields inside this uh, inside this instance. So. Uh, and actually, let me just show you that, and then we'll come back and explain why this is a vector of piece lists. All right, so this, uh, this piece list class, or instance piece list, right? This is exactly what you would expect it to be. It is a vector of pieces. So, and, and we can actually go look at this instance layout piece class. You know, there's not, nothing else in this class other than this vector of, of instance layout pieces. Okay. This is the uh, the base version of it, um, but there's actually, you know, the most common the most common one is uh, this uh, this sort of instance layout piece that's templated, right? Effectively, this is the type erased version, right? Uh, without any template class, and this is the templated one, which has you know your number of dimensions and your coordinate type, right? And it's just a rectangle uh, describing the bounds as you would expect, right? And so your your list of pieces, right, are effectively just a list of list of rectangles. Um, You'll notice there's also an affine layout piece, which also contains, you know, descriptions of the strides and offsets, right? You can see that inherits from instance layout piece. And, and actually, pretty much everything that, like, Legion, for example, allocates our affine layout pieces because we can actually provide all the strides and, and offsets. But, um, and so this is the most common case. So effectively, what this is, is this is a rectangle, you know, which is described with, you know, a set, it can be described by strides and offsets. Um, these, this offset, you know, actually allows you to offset a piece with respect to another piece uh, inside of the same instance. So you can sort of, your rectangles don't have to be laid out all contiguously next to each other, right? You can effectively uh, uh, stagger them a little bit if you want to add some padding between the, between the rectangles um, as you lay them out in memory, right? And so that gives you a little, an extra degree of, of freedom there. Um, and so Le Legion creates, you know, affine layout pieces when it makes everything. And, and this is probably the most common case that we encourage uh, other users to actually, actually do as well. Okay, so coming back to this, like, uh, uh, let's see. Um, uh. Right, so coming back to this instance layout, right? Now we've got this, we've got this vector of instance piece lists. So this is like a list of lists, right? Um, and so this instance piece list is just describing the rectangles themselves. And you might be asking to yourself, well, okay, why do I actually have a vector of those? Why don't I just have like a single piece list, you know, for my entire instance? Well, the reason for that is that you might actually have multiple fields inside of the same instance, right? So maybe you want to store like the same, uh, like you want to store multiple fields, you know, in every single rectangle, right? Every rectangle is maybe describing a, an array of structs or a struct of arrays, right? Um, for all those, those different, different cases, right? Well, in that case, you actually need to have separate piece lists for all of the fields that don't share sort of the same offsets relative to each other. Um, and this is a little bit of a uh, mind bending concept a little bit, um, but effectively this will be, this vector is indexed, is pointed to by uh, different fields that all share sort of the same offsets. So, so those offsets and those affine pieces, right? If you can have multiple fields that all share sort of the same structure, they can all point to this in, the same instance piece list. And th they're pointed to by, uh, this thing at the top, which I showed you before, um, these field groups, right? So this this offset, or, or sorry, let's see. Uh, uh, this is the layout constraints. Sorry, pointing you at the wrong thing. Uh, where here we go. These fields, these field field layout things, right? This list index is what's pointing into that vector of instance piece lists, right? And so you're effectively saying, you know, for a particular field in this map, 
you know, which list am I going to refer to uh, in that in that uh, list of in that list of lists, right? Uh, additionally, I can also specify a relative offset for my field, right? Rel with inside of those uh, layouts, right? Or inside of that instance piece list, which means that like my field will be offset, you know, inside of those individual pieces themselves by this little bit. And so, so that way you can share the same piece list for multiple fields as long as they have sort of the same striding structure, right? And then this is the size of my field in bytes, you know, so Realm knows how to how to index into things, right? And so effectively it's up to clients to sort of figure out which fields share the same substructures inside of those instance piece lists and then be able to go through and actually, you know, decide what how many instance piece lists they need to make, you know, to deduplicate across fields. Technically, you could just like make one instance piece list for every field, and that would actually work probably okay, but you're yeah, I think realms indexing will actually get a little bit less efficient if you if you don't share piece lists where fields actually share the same structure. I, I guess like the indexing isn't less efficient. You'll actually waste a little more memory for building like lookup structures and stuff. Because you could actually share the same lookup structure uh, for multiple different fields if you if you had to, uh, if you actually deduplicate them here uh, on the user side. So so anyway, um, that is how you build an instance layout generic, right? It's a it's literally um, a list of lists uh, corresponding to uh, all these different pieces um, in inside of the instance, right? And the common case, you know, actually, uh, where did it go? Uh, instance layout. Or actually, I actually want to, yeah. Right, and so the, the common case is probably that you have, you know, um, ha have hopefully just one one instance piece list here and all the fields share it, right? And that's actually the case in AOS cases and instructive arrays where all the fields are the same size. But if you're interleaving fields um, of different sizes in the same instance in instructive arrays or hybrid format, then you'll actually need to have multiple instance piece lists. Uh, here to describe all those those cases. Um, so it's up to clients to build these things and then pass them into Realm, and Realm is actually going to take them and actually use those to to construct the instance uh, and actually be able to to build them. Um, let me actually show you an example of actually doing doing this in practice. So this is the uh, the choose instance layout uh, class that right. This is a static static method on instance generic instance layout generic. It's kind of a helper function to help build one of these instance layout generics, but it's going to build one of these these things, right? And so effectively, like you know, it takes an index space, a set of layout constraints, which are kind of like a helper class. Uh, and I actually can show you what that looks like. I think that's up here at the top. Uh, these instance layout constraints effectively say, you know, you know, what are what is my field ID? Do I have an offset for it? Um, do, how big is my size? What alignment do I require for these fields? And then I can group fields. Uh, or I can just put all these fields uh, into a set of field groups, right, and pass in those those constraints, right? And those come in here from the, the user, and you also specify an ordering of dimensions. So like, uh, this is just you know you can't really tile anything with this particular helper method, um, but you can effectively do it, do like Fortran order or C order of dimensions and stuff. You can specify what order to lay out the dimensions in. Right, and so the first thing this does is it actually goes through and computes the piece bounds, right? So like if I have a dense index space, right, I'm just gonna have a single piece bounds, right, for my bounds, right, for that index space. But if I have a sparsity map, I'm gonna iterate over the sparsity map in, in there and then actually pull out, you know, all of the uh, all of the little pieces. I think in this case, we're actually building, yes, yeah, so this is actually building a bounding volume box, which is just gonna make like a single, uh, a single uh, upper bound uh, on this particular instance. So it's not even doing the uh, the sparse case. The sparse case is actually down here, I think. You could actually pass in like a covering of rectangles, right, and actually propagate, you know, effectively create a set of piece bounds that are actually like fully, you know, uh, like for all the different rectangles in this uh, in this set, right? And you can actually see, um, see down here, right, th this is actually calling this version here just with a set of piece bounds that are just of, of size one, right, a vector of size one. Right, but if the user had actually called this with like you know their own their own vector of rectangles that describe the the covering, right now now we can iterate over here and actually figure out um, you know which fields can actually be grouped together into the same piece list. Um, there is a lot of integer math in here that I'm not going to go through because uh, it's pretty tedious. Um, uh, so you guys can work through this and figure out you know how it figures out that fields can be grouped together and which ones cannot. Um, but down here at the bottom, you know, effectively at the end, we actually end up, you know, making, where, where did it go? Uh, we actually end up making affine pieces in here. Uh, I'm trying to find the actual 
memory allocation here for those piece lists um, or those affine pieces. If someone else spots it, can let me know. I thought it was down at the bottom, but maybe not. Hmm. Oh, I'm blanking on it. I think it's actually, where, where did it go? Should actually be allocating uh, an affine piece list in here. Ah, oh, there it is. Yeah, so here's the affine piece layout uh, creation. So, you know, you can actually see where these are made, but I definitely encourage you to offline to work through some of the uh, the integer math here to figure out how fields can be grouped together uh, and which fields cannot be, right? Um, and so it's pretty tricky, uh, but again, this is why we have helper method for it. And and for example, like Legion does all this work for users so they don't have to, to describe in realm instance layout generics. They're, they're kind of, they're kind of annoying to specify if you want to do something really sophisticated, but you can actually do all sorts of cool stuff. Like, you know, the nice thing about this is that, you know, you can effectively pick your, your coverings. You could even like, it, it, you could even like tile these, like, like if you had like a multi, uh, if like your index space was, was actually dense, one of the things that Legion lets you do is actually like, you know, tile this so that you could like do like, um, sort of like, like, like imagine you had a, a three dimensional space and you want to tile like, little chunks of four by four by four blocks, right? You could lay out those blocks in like a Z order curve, right? Uh, inside this instance, you could do that by making each, you can effectively tell Realm how, the order in which to lay out the pieces for each of those little four by four blocks and stuff. So like you can do all sorts of really sophisticated layout tricks to describe interleaving of dimensions and fields and, and stuff. So this is a fully general sort of layout description um, that lets you do all sorts of, of really cool stuff. I think the only thing that it probably can't do is let you describe like, you know, effectively uh, a Morton curve or a, or helper curve, you know, with the individual points inside the index space. That's probably the only thing that it can't do, but anything else that you want to do, interleaving fields and dimensions, right? It can effectively encapsulate all those different kinds of things and and, and actually make an instance uh, for, for all those things. So that's how you make an instance layout generic. Let's actually take a look at what happens when that uh, create call actually gets done once you've got an instance layout generic. Um, and we'll see why I described all the instant layout generic. It'll actually be very important for, you know, how we build accessors and stuff. Uh, let's see. Okay, so here's the create instance call, um, passing in uh, instance layout generic. And you'll see this turns around and calls region instance simple, um, create instances calling into the base classes of the base impl class for region instance, right, to actually make the instance. Uh, so we can look for region instance impl, create instance, Oh, let's see. Yep, here we go. Okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, you know, pretty standard Realm structure here, right? We can get our memory impl. Uh, we haven't looked at memory impuls um, today or, or yet, but effectively it's a, a pointer to a memory. Um, and we'll probably go look at that later. Uh, later in a, or sorry, in a later lesson. Um, memory impuls are a wrapper around all the different kinds of memories that you know, that client modules can create, right? So if you have, every module can implement, you know, its own kind of memory memories and, and provide a memory impl. So it's just like an, a generic interface to all kinds of memories that can be made by by different different modules, right? So you can get that memory impl. Uh, we've got some, you know, once we've got our, our impl, you know, we can record a bunch of profiling measurements. We make our event for saying when this, uh, uh, when this class is, or I guess if we have a, let's see, if we, Oh, this is actually, sorry, if we don't have an impl, this is sort of the fast path out uh, for the case where we actually couldn't couldn't create a, a region instance right away. Like maybe we had run out of IDs or something like that. Um, uh, yeah, so there's actually, you know, based on the, the sort of the key encoding that I showed you or the ID encoding that I showed you in an earlier lecture, right? There's a maximum number of instance IDs that can be given out in a particular memory, right? And so if you've run out of instance IDs, uh, then, then we can actually fail this right away. And so that's what that case is happening here. But this is the common case down here. Um, where we can actually make our instance, right? Um, we're going to store our instance layout generic here, right? So that instance layout generic is actually something that Realm takes ownership of, right? It's going to get stored as part of the implementation of this instance, right? And we're going to use that for doing lookups uh, into this uh, into this instance later. Um, you can see there's actually this this is actually this compile lookup program is actually going to be you know sort of an acceleration data structure for actually actually accessing this instance. Now, if your your instance is just like a you know, single rectangle, this will actually be a pretty simple program. Um, but but effectively, like in cases where you actually have a bunch of pieces, this will actually is actually going to go build a KD tree um, to actually look up, you know, be able to do random access into the instance with approximately logarithmic time uh, by looking up 
you know, which piece uh, your points are in uh, sort of very efficiently. Uh, and we'll go look at that uh, a little bit here. Um, the next thing you do is you actually ask your memory to do, uh, to actually try to allocate uh, storage uh, for, this, uh, for this memory, or sorry, for this instance. Uh, we're not going to look at this today. This is actually going to be a whole lecture unto itself uh, to talk about how memories actually allocate uh, space for these instances, because uh, it's a whole whole big topic unto itself. But you effectively get back a uh, uh, a result here saying, you know, were you able to allocate the instance right away? If so, that's great. Uh, we can immediately, you know, we don't even pass back a ready event. Uh, in the case where you know either the instance was or the allocation failed or it was canceled, right? Then we can can fail out quickly. And there's also this case where the allocation was deferred, right? Effectively saying, you know, either the event hasn't been triggered yet. Um, uh, or like we had to do an allocation with a deferred allocation, which we'll talk about in, in some future lesson. Um, uh, and then we have to do some, some extra stuff for that and make a, a, an event uh, to, to correspond to that. Um, and, and then we can actually return back our ready event uh, when we're done. So that's actually how you make the instance, right? And once you've done that, you've actually got one of these instance simples, a region instance simple, you know, that, that Realm actually knows about and can actually be referred to anywhere uh, inside of the system, right? Um, and and that's, you know, how, how instances get allocated. Now I'll point out one very important property of this, right? Which is that the nice thing about this instance impl is that it's actually wrapping all the details of this memory impl. And so like, even though, lots of different modules might come in and provide their own memory implementations. There's only one region instance, you know, impl class, and it abstracts over top of the memory that, um, that, that this instance uh, is actually, you know, stored in, right? And so that's how you sort of decouple like accessing data uh, from these memory impuls, right? And so what we'll see is like, when you actually want to access data in this impl, it'll sort of come through, the, all, all of it will come through this sort of generic region instance class and then dispatch to the right memory and those memories are where the, like the actual you know modules will have different different implementations for say like for memories that are allocated in in like host memory versus like CUDA device memory versus any other kind of memory that you might have maybe in the file system or or what have you. So let's actually look at how you actually in access these instance this instance data uh, using accessors, and then we'll see how we hit this memory impl class. Actually, let me just show you the memory impl uh, interface uh, here just to sort of forecast what's going to happen, but. This is the memory impl uh, base class, right? There's lots of different kinds of, of memories today. Um, so here, here you can see sort of the allocate uh, storage. Um, but the more interesting things that you're gonna get, these virtual methods, these pure virtual methods here are sort of the things that different modules are responsible for implementing uh, inside, of, inside of Realm uh, to support a memory. And the instance class is gonna call these things to do, be able to do things like, you know, put, put bytes and get bytes of data you know, potentially from 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 different memories, right? And there's also getting pointers and stuff. Sean has this to do here, here, uh, but he actually relies on this this method quite a lot uh, inside of the accessors. So like, it will take some refactoring to to get rid of this uh, the, these particular methods. But effectively, these methods are what are going to allow accessors to actually be able to put bytes and get bytes out of lots of different different kinds of kinds of memory. And actually, I think you know probably the more common case actually is getting these pointers. I actually think. Uh, these these get instance pointers are actually more generic because get bytes and put bytes are not you notice that these virtual methods are not like you know there, there's no CUDA host device annotations on here uh, and that means that like you know you can't actually call these methods on the device right um, and so we'll actually see how the accessors kind of get around that by using some of these pointers they sort of grab these pointers at the beginning of of creating an accessor and then they use those pointers to actually do dereferences uh, into memory. Okay, so let's actually go look at um, some accessors a little bit. Uh, let me find the instance layout class or instance layout.h header file here. I guess it's over here. Yep. Okay, so this is the instance layout header file, which we were looking at before to describe piece lists and stuff. But there's also some other classes in here that are actually quite useful um, for actually accessing data inside of instances. So Realm provides uh, this concept of an accessor, right? An accessor is effectively a way to get access to the data inside of a physical instance uh, in kind of a generic way that's decoupled from the layout, right? You, you, you often want it to be the case that, you know, your instance layout doesn't, like when you go to index into your instance, you want that to be done correctly regardless of how it was laid out, right? Now, obviously there are performance considerations there. You probably want to iterate over like the points in your index space in an efficient way, and there's, there's support for that. But, but 
you still want your code to be correct regardless of, of what order you iterate over points and stuff or do random accesses into a, into an instance. You don't want to be relying on raw pointers and stuff that are subject to changes of like layout and stuff like that. Right, so Realm provides accessors for doing that. And we have a couple of different kinds of accessors here. So the generic accessor is the first kind of this, right? In fact, it allows you to have sort of a way to access into any in instance, even ones that are potentially like on remote nodes, right? And you can just sort of do reads and writes on this. Uh, so you construct the accessor, you know, by passing in an instance and a field that you want to access, potentially giving a subfield offset or, you know, sub rec that you want to access inside of that instance, right? And then you can do reads and writes uh, to that uh, uh, to that instance through this accessor, right? So, you know, you can read a point, you know, you pass in a point and you get back, you know, a value that is the field type, right, for this particular accessor. Similarly, you can write, you can write a point and pass in a value and that'll store that into that, into that particular accessor. Um, right, and then, you know, this, this nice thing about this generic accessor is it works for all kinds of instances regardless of the layout. But the problem is that it's also a little bit slow and it doesn't let you get raw pointers into the instance if you need them, right? Because this accessor may, in some cases, this will actually support uh, like uh, actually like doing like puts and gets over the network to an instance on a remote node, right? Say if you had mapped your instance into like registered memory on a remote node, you could actually build an accessor on a different node, right? That would actually be able to do reads and writes to that by doing, you know, effectively the accessor would turn into doing, you know, puts and gets over the network uh, to that, that instance on a remote node. Right, and so the generic accessor is really flexible, but also slow in that you know it effectively forces you to do, you know, very functional kinds of reads and writes. Now, there's also uh, the affine accessor, which is effectively a special case accessor, right, that effectively handles the case where you have an instance with a single piece, right, that can be described as just a single affine piece, right. So, effectively, if you try to make an affine accessor. Um, with you know one of these uh, with, with an instance that is has multiple pieces, this accessor will die a horrible death. And you can actually test whether it's safe to do to make an affine accessor by using these like is compatible static methods here uh, to check to see if you know like does this instance have multiple pieces or not, right? And it'll tell you it'll it'll effectively fail if it'll give you a false back from this if if you're not allowed to do that, right? But if you try to call the actual constructor itself, it'll just die a, a horrible death. Right, but now we've got some methods that are actually much more efficient, like reads and uh, we can actually get raw pointers into this instance, right? Uh, reads and writes will actually be considerably more efficient. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, in these constructors, if we actually go look at like the affine accessor constructor, uh, there we go. So we've got an affine accessor uh, constructor here. They call this, uh, this reset method. But what this reset method is really doing, right, is effectively like, you know, it's effectively getting the uh, the instance layout uh, for this particular instance, right? Um, so it's actually grabbing like the, the layout for this thing, right? It's getting all the pieces, it's getting the layout piece, right? And it's actually grabbing a raw pointer into this instance. So it can actually store that in this base member variable, right? And it's also grabbing all the strides associated with this affine layout piece, right? For the layout for this particular instance, right? And by doing so, it can store all those things. And then things like reads and writes and stuff, if I come down here to, you know, read, um, right? Effectively, you can call the, it's just dereferencing a, a get pointer, you know, on this particular point. And if I look for get pointer here, right, here's your affine accessor get pointer, and you notice it does something really efficient, right? It's effectively just start with the base, you know, for each one of the points, multiply by the, the stride offset for each of those dimensions, right? And sum that into your raw pointer, and then you can return the result, right? And the compiler, hopefully, like because this loop is based on a static bounds and the number of dimensions in the XR, hopefully unrolls all this and turns this into a nice fast like a dot product, right? And so these accesses actually get done incredibly fast whenever you you access into a uh, an affine accessor, right? So effectively, it's pulled out the raw pointer and stuff like that, right? And you can see here are the memory var member variables for for the affine accessor. You can see it's storing the the base pointer and the strides and stuff like that. Um, uh, you can also see there is a you can also see the affine accessor supports, you know, use on the device, right? So you see lots of, you know, Realm CUDA HD uh, should probably be renamed since it also supports other kinds of accelerators now. But effectively, this is where we, you know, this is a macro that will expand to any kind of of, of device, you know, uh, sort of annotations. And you won't see this on the generic accessor, right? You'll only see that on on like the affine accessor um, and some of the other ones that actually support, you know, grabbing these raw pointers. Because like you notice what happens is like these constructors, 
they don't have the uh, the CUDA HD annotators, right? I, mean, I guess they do on the default constructor, but not on the, the other ones, right? So you kind of have to make these things on the host, right? That'll prop up, that'll populate these uh, these member fields uh, here, right? And then the user can actually pass these whole access earth by value down onto the device, right? And so there's, once you get down on the device, uh, then you can do things like the get pointer call and it'll just touch these base member variables and bounds and stuff, right? And effectively be able to, to be used on the, on the actual device. Uh, you may notice there's lots of Cocoa stuff in here uh, for supporting uh, Cocoa stuff. Or, uh, and so Realm Maxers actually work inside of other frameworks and stuff like that uh, as a kind of view onto the onto the data. Um, the other interesting kind of accessor that I do want to call your attention to here is these multi-affine accessors, right? And so these multi-affine accessors are what support, you know, effectively random accesses into uh, accessor or into instances that have multiple pieces, multiple affine pieces. Right, so you can use a multi-affine accessor uh, to actually be able to access into instances that have several pieces, right? Um, it has a lot of the same methods as uh, as the other uh, uh, the other um, as the normal affine accessor, right? But instead of being able to do like random accesses in here, this uh like like uh, uh, the random accesses here actually have to be a little bit more sophisticated, right? Because if you give it a generic point, right, you're gonna have to go figure out which piece that point is in. Um, and this is actually where, you know, some knowledge of this, uh, these lookup programs that were, that were compiled, right, for the instance when it was created are actually going to be incredibly useful for being able to do random lookups, lookups inside of these, uh, inside of instances that have several pieces. So let's actually take a look at like how you actually do like a, a read on a multi-affine um, accessor. So let's see. So here's our multi-affine accessor. It's calling read, right? And you see this turns around and it's just dereferencing the pointer. So it's calling this base uh, pointer implementation, right? And that method is actually up here. This is the multi-affine accessor pointer method. So giving you a point, a field pointer, right? Given, actually, let's actually look at the one with the point. So, so we're passing in a point uh, and we're giving back a pointer to that particular, you know, entry for this field, right? Inside of this instance, right? Um, so what this does is it's actually going to like, you know, effectively have this, it has this piece lookup instruction. And so let's actually go take a look at where that comes from. It actually comes over here from instance layout. Um, let's see, where is the instruction class? Yeah, okay, so here we go. So this instruction, right, is effectively, um, this is actually in this, uh, this class compiled program, which I don't know, I, I'm not a huge fan of this name of this uh, this this uh, class here, but um, but effectively what it is is going to be a way of traversing an acceleration data structure uh, for this particular uh, for this particular uh, layout generic um, or instance layout generic object, right? Um, and you can see right now there's effectively only two opcodes. Uh, there's an invalid opcode and a splitting plane opcode, right? Um, and so this, the idea of this is that effectively these, um, uh, like the way this instance layout generic works, or, or sorry, the way this compiled program works is it's gonna build a KG tree by creating splitting planes um, for each of the dimensions and keep recursing until you get down to like, you know, uh, uh, pieces with just a single, or, or, or sorry, uh, subsets with just a single rectangle in them or single piece inside of each of them, right? Um, and that's effectively what's gonna allow you to actually traverse you know, very efficiently, uh, this this like like all the sets of pieces to find the most efficient one uh, to actually actually look up. Um, so if I actually go look, let's see if we can actually find this uh, find this code in instance layout. Um, I wonder if it's an in instance layout.cc. Uh, nope, uh, I think it's over here in the header file. Mm, yeah, that's how we're doing the jumping. Right. Um, ah, yes. So, right. So here are the splitting planes. The splitting. Eh. There's a splitting plane class, right? That actually defines how you build a splitting plane uh, for this. Um, I might need to get Sean to come back and actually describe how this actually works, but. The conceptual, you know, way I at least want to like, 
I'd explain conceptually how this works. Um, but let me actually come back here to the read method because I think it's actually will show us what we actually want. Um, actually, let's see. We want pointer on multi-affine. There you go. So, right. So the way to think of this is there's a list of, of instructions here. So you start with the start instruction, which is effectively the first splitting plane, right? Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to iterate through the pieces or, or through these instructions, right, through each splitting plane and figure out whether you want to go to the left or the right. I mean, these splitting planes work on alternating dimensions, right? They work on, you know, for however many dimensions are in this instance, right? There are splitting planes that split, you know, as necessary to keep to keep subdividing the pieces and stuff like that, right? And so you walk through the, these instructions in order, right? And you grab the, you know, the corresponding uh, uh, piece. You check to see if it, or I guess this is the case where you get to the, the very end, the, the actual, like, last, this is the base case where you actually arrive in the actual piece and you test to see if it contains it. Right. If you contain it, then you're you're good. If not, you can you can go on to the next piece in this like subplane. I guess we only subdivide until until uh, we have a subset or a certain number of uh, or maximum bound on the number of of pieces in, in a subplane. Right. But then the more common cases is, is you consider can you iterating here where you effectively like you know you check to see which which side contains your point and then you jump to that next uh, that next next instruction uh, in the program. So you keep sub walking through your your KD tree. Right until you get to the bottom where you've got you know some list of affine pieces, then you iterate through them and find the one that you're you're actually looking for. Uh, it's important to note that this actually is supported on the device. Um, so these uh, effectively these compiled programs uh, with these instructions here are actually get copied down to the device as part of the accessor itself. Right, and so that actually allows for you know being able to do these like KD tree lookups even on the device itself. Right. Um, uh, for actually being able to to accelerate uh, uh, to actually you know be able to accelerate um, uh, 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 lookups and stuff like even on device. Now you might incur a lot of like divergence and stuff in your threads and stuff in, in, when when they're traversing right these different KD trees. So you have to watch out for that uh, for performance reasons. But uh, but again like you know if they all take the same pieces then they'll all be converged walking through all this logic walking through the KD trees and. And stuff like that. So, so you can use all this stuff on the device. Watch out for diver divergence, but you know, uh, it's all all there and supported. Um, one other thing that I did want to point out here, if we actually go look at the generic accessor, here's the generic accessor class. Um, uh, let's see, where's the read method? Right. So here are these. Uh, read untyped and write untyped classes, right? So in the case where like you're actually doing a read or a write uh, for a generic accessor, right? They don't have pointers, right? They're effectively telling the instance, please do a read untyped or write untyped, right? For doing reads and writes uh, into this uh, into this instance. And the reason for that is that if I actually go look at, let's see, where is inst impl? Uh, I probably want inst impl. Yep. So here's the read untyped and write untyped methods on that instance. Well, actually, these are on the, uh, the region instance itself. I think we want region instance simple. Or actually, no, that was, this is the right one. So, right, so we get the region instance simple, right? Then you can fetch out the memory impl for this, right? Um, and when you do that, then you can call this get bytes and put bytes method, right? And remember, these are the methods that are sort of abstracted. They're, they're pure virtual methods, right, on the base memory class. Where's my memory impl class? Um, Right, these are these put bytes and get bytes, right, for actually dispatching, right. And the nice thing about these put bytes and get bytes is they might actually have different implementations depending on whether you're on a, like a local memory or a remote memory or whether that's supported, right. So these might actually turn into like, you know, just look like mem copies in the case where like the memory is local and on this the same system memory, but they might turn into like a gasnet put or a gasnet get or you know ECX put or ECX get, uh, if you know your your instance is actually on another node and in in registered memory and so forth. Um, and so I'm not going to look at that today, um, but just be aware that like these get bytes and put bytes can be implemented in lots of different ways, right? They might also turn into like uh, uh, CUDA mem copies, right? In the case of like you know you do this access from a from the host, but you actually want to put data in the GPU, right? Um, and so so they, these can be implemented in lots of different ways, and we've kind of abstracted over them for for handling those different things. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think. There was something else that I want to cover today. I think this is most of what I want to get through uh, today is how these these different layouts actually work, uh, and how you actually can make instance layout generics and then use them for doing uh, for in accessors for actually doing lookups and stuff and 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 doing things very efficiently. Um, 
yeah, so I think I think that's all I have for today. I'm happy to take questions. Can you explain um, how the the um, get bytes and put bytes? How can they write a write or read a range when you're having like multiple pieces? Because like you could yeah go so, off the end of a piece, right? Yeah, you have to. I mean, these do have to be inside of the inside of the same piece, right? And so I think like these put bytes and get bytes, right? Uh, you have to be very careful about how you call them. You do have to call them. Uh, I mean, I guess there's probably no safety here in the sense that like you could end up dispatching. And, and I think I would have to ask Sean if he actually uses this anywhere. Like technically there, these put bytes and get bytes are, are going to be ignorant of the pieces, right? They're literally going to look into the uh, into the memory and wherever this the, the pointers are in this offset, right? They're going to scribble, right? Uh, or I guess this is get bytes, but if you're going to do put bytes, right? It's literally going to look in this offset or offset into into the instance, right? And then scribble, you know, this number of bytes in that location. And you could potentially like scribble past the end of your piece and stuff like that, right? Um, and so you do have to be careful about how you use these things. They're kind of ignorant. They're, they're literally just like, Put the bytes and get the bytes. They're not gonna check for pieces or any other fancy stuff, right? Um, so you have to pre-compute these offsets into the instance uh, correctly. Um, that's one of the things that I probably should have mentioned is like there are no bounds checks on these accessors. Um, in, in Realm, there are no bounds checks on the accessors. That's a Legion feature, right? So uh, wherever it's in simple uh, is like um, like if you look at generic accessor, um, uh, where did it go? Right, there's, there's no bounds checks on these. You can read and write points that are outside the bounds of your instance and maybe scribble or, or read from memory that you actually shouldn't, right? Um, so Legion has bounds checks on Axers, but but these don't, or, but Realm Axers do not, so. Anyway, Manol, did I answer your question about the put bytes and get bytes? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, and, and I assume you also can't um, safely advance a pointer like once you get a pointer from the instance you're not there's no support for like advancing it uh, so and jumping over to the next there, like, there is a little bit there is a little bit um so actually let's go look at the affine xer here um so in the affine xer uh let's see actually interestingly i don't see it on the affine xer but i know this is on the multi-affine accessor so like one interesting thing you can do, this is on the app, this is on the multi-affine XR. We could actually probably conceptually do this on the, the affine XR as well. But so here you can actually ask for a pointer to a rectangle of points uh, inside of this this uh, this instance, right? And to get the struct. Now this rectangle has to be in this in a single piece, right? So we're going to look up this rectangle, right? And it has to exist in just one piece. If this rectangle spans multiple pieces, I believe this code dies a horrible death. Um, Let's actually see if we can find it here. Uh, it's affine accessor, there's the point. Okay, so here's the rectangle version of this, right? Um, so let's see. This is the uh, sort of the fast path where we're, you know, effectively, r r these accessors actually keep around a little bit of state, which actually track to see if like, you know, uh, if you're accessing in the same piece as the previous time. It'll have a, sh a fast path here, right, to effectively detect that and otherwise go look up the piece. Um, uh, so let's see. This is traversing here. Yeah, so I think it's actually, I'm actually looking at this code. I feel like there's actually a bug here and that this doesn't return. Uh, like if it can't hit in here, Right. Yeah, I think there's actually a bug here. Uh, I, I bet you no one has ever actually tested this code. But effectively, what I'm looking at is like in the case where this rectangle doesn't exist inside of one of these affine pieces, right? You're effectively going to, you're not going to hit here, right? Like effectively, just testing to see if the rectangle is contained in the affine piece. And if it is, right, then we can return. But there's like no return statement here in the case where we never hit. And this is a while true loop. Like we could keep going around this loop. We might iterate off the end of the list, I think, actually here. I guess if i becomes null, oh yeah, so Sean at least has an assertion here that i be never becomes zero, right? So that would probably, you'd probably hit this if you walked off the end of the list. Um, so yeah, uh, looks like we should probably improve the error handling case for this particular case where like your rectangle doesn't exist inside of a single piece. Um, there's at least an assertion that we'll catch it here, but but definitely there's a there's like a, 
a missing you know statement here to, to handle the case where you do don't have anything it would probably be good if we just return null uh, from this if if you can't actually find this rectangle or if it spans multiple pieces right um, but at least we're checking for the case where like it actually exists your whole rectangle exists inside the piece and then we give you back the strides right these are the, the pointer strides that actually allow you to index uh, into this uh, into this like using this pointer so like you know effectively as you step your pointer, Right, you can, I guess you can't really step your pointer directly just by like plus equaling, but you can effectively take your point and multiply by the strides without having to call pointer every time to, to look it up. Um, yeah, so that, that way you can actually do faster accesses outside of the accessor for entire rectangle of points. And I guess for like an affine accessor, you could actually just do that just by like fetching out the, uh, you know, the, these strides, this pointer here, I, I guess you can get a pointer to the, the first point, right? And then these strides here define the strides for the entire the entire rectangle, right? In the affine accessor case. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Uh, thanks, Michael. I think that was pretty good. Um, did. Uh, for me, it was inside about the building the cottage tree. I kind of know I knew that, but uh, I feel uh, it's not really recommended anywhere. So I kind of yeah. uh, uh, think it would be good if we just nail it down some on paper, uh, so to say. Uh, you know, whatever that's going to be uh, in the documentation or photos or, or anything else, it's probably going to be useful. <clears throat> yep. I mean, more documentation will continually be good. Uh, I'm trying to give you guys a flavor of how these things work uh, and point you in the right places. Yeah. Uh, like, I left a lot of details unspecified about how those compiled programs work. Uh, in fact, like, I, yeah. act I actually didn't look at those before I actually started talking here and realized that I sh probably should have dove into those a little bit more detail. But there's an encoding of these compiled programs, and it's actually this is actually an important point of these compiled programs up here. Let's see, where did they go? Um, which is that they can actually be compiled down to a representation that... Uh, can actually be stored on the device, right? Like these, uh, these instructions, right? You notice they all have the Realm HD, Realm CUDA HD stuff on here, right? And that is what what enables them to actually be used on the device and to be compactly stored on the device, right? They can actually be copied by value with the uh, the accessor down to the device, uh, and then be able to be executed on the device. And so, that's actually an important thing, like being able to run run the the KD tree lookups, you know, for multi affine accessors actually on the device. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Is it feasible within the time limits to explain how you would do that tiling you were talking about where you have like, yeah. I assume you meant that like I have a, like a 2D thing, but then I, right. um, mm -hmm. but it stems, but then I tile it in like two by two or four by four. Exactly. Or yeah, so, I mean, actually, if I come, it's definitely, we can definitely do that inside of this uh, the constraint, time constraints here. Let's see here. So let me actually come up here to this, uh, I'll come up here to this, like, uh, this choose instance layout uh, helper method to show you how you would actually change that, right, to actually be able to do, like, the tiling. So let's, 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 we, I, I'm going to assume that we're going to come down this dense case. So what we've got is an index space that's, like, a big rectangle of, like, Let's say it's like 2D point, two, two, it's a two, this is a 2D index space with no sparsity map, right? So it comes down here in the dense case, right? And we've got just like a set of bounds uh, that define the entire rectangle for this index space. So let's say we wanted to tile it, you know, in, in you know, let's say like four by four chunks or something like four by four tiles, right? For this 2D index space, right? Well, all you have to do then, right, is effectively like loop over like uh, you effectively want to loop over the rectangles, the tiles inside of this bigger rectangle that defines the entire index space, right? So you sort of chop it up into four by four blocks and you specify each of those four by four blocks as a new one of these piece bounds, right? So you push, you effectively would need like two for loops here. I mean, I, like this is, an, this is templated. So let's imagine we're just handling the case where n equals two here, right? And so I could write like a, a doubly nested for loop, right? To kind of loop over each of the two dimensions. Right, and walk through and create rectangles, you know, for each each of those entries, right? You sort of step by strides of four through each dimension, right? And and update the lower and upper bounds for my rectangle accordingly as I step through each dimension by strides of four. Right. And I just keep pushing rectangles onto the back of these piece bounds, right? This is just a vector of rectangles. Right. And actually the order of these rectangles is the order in which you they actually will get laid out in memory in the instance. Right. And so uh, so effectively you could create like that, those four by four tiles for that two-dimensional index space, 
just by iterating through them and the order in which you iterate through dimensions, right? The order of, do you like your for loops? Do you do X first or, and then Y second or Y first and then X second, right? Like that defines the order in which you lay out these or, or push those rectangles into this list of vec or this vector of rectangles. And then when you come down here into the, the choose instance layout with like the list of covering rectangles, right? You'll actually see like, you know, there's a, we actually are looping over this covering. Let's see if I can uh, find it here in this, uh, in this mess, here's the loop over the covering, um, right? And that actually will create the affine layout pieces uh, for this particular piece list or instance piece list, right? In that order, right? And the order in which you put these affine layout pieces into that list, the, this instance piece list here, right? Actually defines the order that they'll be created in, in, in memory, right? And so that, that's exactly how you get an instance that's potentially tiled right, for like a, what is normally like a dense index space, right? And this is actually exactly how, how Legion does it uh, for you whenever you ask for, you know, whenever you use a tiling constraint Legion, this is, this is, it'll just make lots of pieces, right, for each of the different tiles that you're asking for. Would this require a KD tree to traverse or like index into? Yeah, so right now Realm doesn't have any knowledge of the, like, like intelligent tiling like, like it doesn't realize that it can do modulus logic, right? I think we'd probably want to make like a new kind of accessor, right? That effectively knew that it was tiled. So you could actually do like the the modulus lookup to figure out like which piece you're in without having to walk a KD tree, right? But today you would just kind of have to, have to, um, have to use the multi-affine accessor today, right? And it would use the KD tree kind of uh, lookup. Now the, the KD tree would be very efficient because, right, like you've tiled it. So the splitting planes are very efficient and stuff like that um, uh, for random accesses. So it would still be pretty good, but maybe you could do better if you knew that like, you know, the pieces were laid out, you know, in some, some deterministic way, you could actually compute which piece you were going to be in and then jump to it, right? Uh, without having to do the KD tree, KD tree lookup. But I think that would require a different, different accessor uh, uh, kind to be made uh, to actually actually do that. Makes sense, thank you. Okay, any more questions? All right, so Next week is going to be a Legion week, but it's going to be a sort of a, a digression Legion week to talk about the Legion profiler because uh, there's some other folks that want to hear about it um, uh, much earlier than we had planned. So, so we're going to so Elliot Slaughter will be here to talk about the internals of the Legion profiler uh, next week. Um, and if you guys have any more questions, I'm happy to take them offline as always. Okay, talk to you soon.